Miriam, it's our real pleasure to welcome you to the Rosalie Invites series here. Um, when I think of some of our conversations, I was remembering um, you talking about uh, writing a book, one day you will, it'll be written. And in, perhaps this is a, a rehearsal for, for this moment. Uh, is that possible? It's a rehearsal for your, the starting of your uh, <laughs> writing of the book? It might, be a, it might be a rehearsal for a starting point. I think it is an exploration. And I'm very glad to be here and to be part of uh, Rosalie Invite uh, programme. Uh, it is because um, I've been pondering on how to deal with memory, how to deal with the things you have lived through your life. And because that is part of what I'll be talking about uh, uh, today, it has come to mind that it might be a first step into exploring uh, some aspects of past which are worth to be to be shared by other people. Uh, I, I have not uh, finished the idea yet, but it is certainly helpful to to think of uh, your work and to think of the things that aspired in your life and having to do with the, with the work and how theatre has given me a broader outlook on things, how theatre has brought me throughout the world and what I experienced there of the reactions of people as well and how you feel that any kind of message or any kind of uh, dramaturgical decision can be shared even by people in Japan or in South America or wherever we have been. It is, uh, it's a richness in life, but you need to have an open mind and the time to deal with it because writing is a very solitary business and demands a high degree of discipline which I don't always have. <laughs> well, perhaps in this sense, the idea of the thinking it out loud um, is, is, is a good uh, way to um, continue, explore. But um, I want to refer to the title. You came up with a, a wonderful title, um, When a Word Becomes a World. Yes. And we often think about the importance of the, the significance of the word, um, but when a word becomes a world, it seems to bring out a whole lot of... Um, Images. Of course, because that's the essence of my work. It is trying to find a way that the word does become universal, does become something bigger than the word in itself. And that can only be achieved when the information you give or the patterns of thinking you present to an audience enables them to let their, their imagination run free instead of pinpointing every detail so that it may be very virtuose what is uh, being presented, but does not touch them. And the basic thing for me is to touch, is the communication with an audience, yes. to give them the freedom to interpret and to not close the door to their imagination or their interpretation but give give the space yes. for them to feel and to reflect yes. and not to have them sit there thinking what does she mean now what does it mean now but to give them enough information and uh, even from my body because my body is my archive it's not just the brain it is it is my entire being and to share that and to achieve a sort of communitas yes. and that is my dream it's a good dream and maybe just finally a little bit on the the, the structure tonight because we uh, we talk about um in the three parts of this you you you, you brought together uh, the work in, in a sense three parts maybe just very briefly touch on the on the three parts uh, uh, well the the first for me is the, the fragments of imagination and the fragments of memory that everybody has. And everybody knows there are moments that wild things come to mind, even if it's only a very tiny so fragment of a memory. So that will be the first part. We'll deal with the memory. How does the memory work? What, 
does it entail? What does it need? How does it have to be nourished? And of course, uh, in reference to the work of Francis Yates, uh, to have the art of memory discussed in a way that deals with the art of memory of theatre throughout the ages. That is the first part. So, time is of essence. And the time it takes to explore, to take this journey towards a sense of finality in the work or in your life, if you take a broader picture, is the second part, which I call the Towers of Words, which is not my idea. It was presented by Dr. van der Vost, whom uh, I had the pleasure to be part of the jury when he got his uh, doctorate. And I was so impressed by his way of formulating how modern theatre, how an actor in modern theatre works and thinks. And that is the second part, which will be in Flemish. Uh, to honour him also, because it is a, a great body of work, which deals also, in essence, with the memory. How do you make of a active memory, a sort of memory that was lost in time and comes out again to get its final form. That is the second part. And at the end of the second part, I revert back to the beginning, in a sense, because in the end there is always the beginning. And that will be the few elements about time and words coming out of the four quartets of T.S. Eliot, which I consider to be my Bible, if you like. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to give, to give this, this to, to let the space breathe, because we are here in an environment that is, environment that is artistic, an environment that was different. So I want to take, at one point, the moment that I will ask people, close your eyes and try to imagine the clattering of hooves, mm -hmm the big wheels of the carts, yes. the smoky atmosphere when meat was being smoked here in Rosalie's business. Yes. And to think it was not white, it was dark. It was dark and it, had, uh, um, it was maybe greasy. It, it was maybe not so pleasant as it is now, but yes. it is part of the past, so it is part of the now, albeit in a different form. Yes, that's perfect. Vivian de Mook, thank you very much. You're welcome, Ella. Glad to be here. It is so nice at my age to have a cameraman you can flirt with, <laughs> even if it's only to tell you it's time to start. <laughs> I love that sound. It triggers something in my memory. I do not know what it is. A memory is delicate. You can see it on the floor. Parts of the memories are broken off. A memory can be triggered by sound, by smell, beautiful flowers by an image, by hearing voices, the laughter of people, the crying of a child. These memories cannot be controlled. They are part of our being, of a world that has disappeared because life moves on, but somehow Fragments, except the little tiny moments of memory will come back and surprise you because they've got nothing to do with what you are doing at that moment. It is just something, look, hear that? Ha, ah, somebody shouting. Someone at the door, open the door. It is uh, interesting, it's always been interesting for me, memory, 
not just because it is important to an actor, of course, uh, to memorize, to know words, to understand them, to try and find out what their secret is, and we will talk about that, or I will talk about that. You can always say something if you really like it uh, in the course of these moments. Because the, when you came in, you saw the image. I hope you looked at it, if only briefly, the image that comes out of the book of Francis Yates, a complete study of the art of memory, the mnemotics. And in that image, you saw a semicircle, a half circle, divided into pieces with words written in each fragment. And underneath, the seven pillars of wisdom by King Solomon. Now that is something that may trigger a memory in you, because it is the image of a Greek amphitheater. And some of you who have been there, or have been in Turkey or wherever, because they were uh, in lots of places, will remember sitting perhaps high up on a bench with a guide standing in the middle, which in the image is the little round spot where the protagonist used to be. And he would have, he would have torn up a cigarette paper, something so delicate and so light. And you could hear it everywhere. The Greek acoustics. Mm. So that is the start of the art of memory. It was developed in those days. And of course, it continued through the centuries and traveled <coughs> along different forms of theater. In, those, in the ancient days, the big difference with now is, of course, that it was a bit like this. Daylight, and you could see the people, and the people could see you, which is something that now we can only have when we play in open air. In Avignon, for example, where the audience and the protagonists on stage share the same world. You hear the birds, you see a cat walking, you feel the wind, sometimes the rain. It's a lot of rain nowadays. And it, is, it creates a, what I call communitas, because we realize we are both in the real world, not in the mystical, mythical idea of theater that only came later. Because in the beginning, and uh, I take this from Francis Yates, who, whose book inspired me enormously when I read it, because it is a scientific study. No bullshitting here, I mean, it's the real work. And she describes and has illustrations of the various theatres in the various periods. So you will see <coughs> that in the old days, the theatres were manifest buildings, not only on the outside, as it is now the case, uh, mostly for the public, big entrances. Once you get behind the stage, a lot of the time it's shit. Huh? But there were ornaments everywhere. The, the inside of the theatre, the place where the audience would be, and where the protagonists were, was a world, a world of allegorical representations, a world of, of feeling each other, of seeing people eating their sandwiches, drinking their beer, and having the, the swines and the cows and whatever, hearing them outside. So it was more, into the world than it is now. It has now become a cultural temple. 
And part of me misses that element of, one might call it, vulgarity, if one likes. They were both always quite close to the brothels. Um, and uh, the final transition, I think, was when the audience was put in the darkness and all the lights were here. And then everything changed because all of the sudden people tried to be as perfect as possible, recreating a world that was not a world, that was the idea of what a world should be, or the idea of what the translation of a text should be like. And that, of course, has had many influences during all the artistic periods. Yes, the translation, when the light came on the stage, and all of a sudden the actors came out, not in front of a roaring and messy bunch of people, but a black hole. And then it is very difficult to deal with your position in space, because that is what we're here to talk about. The poetics of space, which are so important, because we cannot rely anymore on allegories. The Balkanis are not anymore supported by caryatid figures and allegories of satyrs and of young women in drapery and of mm, lustful men. So because, my dear fellows, the reason why all these seven pillars are there is because they give a sense of direction. I cannot act without a sense of direction because the thought not only moves the body, but the thought moves the brain in search of where do I put this? Where do I throw it into the stage? So, into the audience, sorry. So that at a given point, when I do the performance for the 35th time, or I come in the new theater, I come on stage and I know nada, absolutely nothing, until I'm on the stage and I think, ah, yeah. And the physical memory, the body takes over. And I know, but by doing this and looking at him, I have to say this, looking at you, that changes the direction of the thought and therefore also the direction of the communication. Those are poetics of space and we're here in a space that was not and is not a theatre place. We are here in an artistic space. We are here in a space where two artists combine their efforts to create beautiful things, to work, to work. Whereas once it was different. When Rosalie was here, and we do not know Rosalie, they do not know Rosalie, but we can imagine what it might have been like. Because imagination, that is what an audience should feel, the liberty to interpret and the liberty to understand on their different levels what is being said here <coughs> on stage. So it was not the gentle sound of this. It would be the trampling of the hooves, the horses, the wheels of the carts, and the horses uh, being brought to the carts, and the darkness here, and the smoke, and the smell, the smell of meat being smoked, corpses hanging down from the 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 the, 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 the hooks at the ceiling, and a woman there trying to control everything and being apparently very successful at it. And instead, we are not here in darkness, but we are here in light and we can see the objects around us 
and rejoice and wonder what do they represent. And that is a search. That is an exploration. To me, these, there are certain elements here which I have chosen because they remind me of something. This reminds me of a gentle night. This reminds me of the ripple of water, not the ripple of water that we see nowadays, but the gentle water when you sit next to a spring, a river, the flowers. That reminds me of the beautiful roses, the beautiful flowers you can get into your house. This reminds me of something, and I will explain to you later. It will not be what you are thinking of now. And then this is, for me, important, because it represents something that we will be talking about, or at least I will be talking about, unless feel free to comment if you like. Memory is, the brain moves in mysterious ways. Of course, there are brain surgeons and everything is divided and blah, blah, blah. But the fact that at one point during the day, during the night, we all have these moments when all of a sudden a smell or a sound or whatever uh, I said before can trigger you back, can give you a small, small moment. And you may not always be able to say, to place it in time or to place it in the right circumstances. It is not necessary. It is something that at one point in your life made such an impression that it stayed. And these things get bigger and bigger as you grow older because you've had more years to accumulate these things, these fragments of a life. They do not explain your life, but they are there and they cannot be ignored. And in a way, this, what I would call a subconscious memory, is what we should have, what we are looking for, where we are acting. So as to be beyond the word, but that the word to us and to you becomes a world, a world of feeling, of emotion, a world of, of ideas, a world of recognition of certain elements in life. And of course, the interpretation of these things will vary according to the times we live in. So that is why I was so thankful that uh, Alain gave me this opportunity. And we talked uh, a lot about this spatial, these poetics of space, as I said, because I cannot act without a sense of direction. Therefore, this meager, meager attempt to bring a few elements which might give me a sense of support and at the end give you a sense of recognition. Not recognition of how I do it, but recognition of the elements. They say that uh, there is one animal with a very long memory, and that is the elephant. Of course, they say that in the Eastern countries, because there they have elephants, we don't. <laughs> and let's face it, it is true. I've heard many stories, seen many documentaries, an elephant does remember things. Of course, he does go like, oh, I've been swimming here before. <laughs> it has to do with what has happened to him and who treated him well and who did not. There is a reason why this object is here, because this glass object contains a lot of things, but it contains a small elephant. You will see, well, 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 maybe you may not see it, but they see it on, on screen. And this <laughs> elephant, yes, I, they, I mean, I'm not going to walk around with these, these things that can break like nothing. I mean, I've already 
scared to touch something because of that. Um, so afterwards you can all come and look for the small elephant. To me, that represents the elephant god. That represents Ganesha, son of Shiva and Parvati, the elephant god who is revered in India and who is the protector of knowledge and wisdom. And he is also the protector of the performing arts. Good for the elephants. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I had a memory like an elephant. Unfortunately, I think I do, because I have fragments. I was talking about the fragments, and we all, we all have them. And uh, uh, we don't always uh, recognize it or I are attentive to it. But uh, so be it. Now, give me a moment. Where was I thinking? The art of memory is also the art of how to develop an actor's work. And as to come back to the uh, moments of the fragment, sometimes a fragment can happen in a performance because something, a memory can be triggered, and that is not a subconscious memory, that is a memory that has been trained to become subconscious on stage, is triggered by music. Sometimes it's triggered by very intelligent sounds that have been composed, voices working together, a, a, a world of sound and that surrounds you, surrounds the audience. Sometimes it's movement. Something will move, somebody will move, there will be a dance. So these are all elements that as an actor you take. You see it, you react to it. You react to it because it helps you to further your cause. It helps you to give meaning to what you want to say and gives meaning to what has happened there. And sometimes it is very hard work because if the work you are dealing with is a large body of words, then you have to look for the words. Then you have to look here. And this next part, bit I do in Flemish, because to me, it is part of the doctorate of uh, a great actor and friend, a um, great director and an inspirer, uh, artistic <coughs> leader of a company he has now moved, given to younger people. How brave is that? Lucas van der Vost, who was the uh, director of the Tijd um, theatre group in Antwerp. And so now I will go over there, hi guys, <laughs> to the, the Tower of Words. Now I have to take a few elements here. My glasses, my trusted friend. Yeah, well, hmm? I'll leave him here. So, the thesis van Lucas van der Vost uh, is eigenlijk een poging om op een wetenschappelijke manier een soort van het, wat ik zou noemen een moderne, niet dramaturgie, maar het acteren te analyseren. En hij noemt dit torens van woorden, want dat is het in feite als we met een tekst geconfronteerd zijn, zeker wanneer de tekst alleen afhangt van de persoon die daar staat en die het verhaal moet brengen of de tekst moet verdedigen, dan zit je voor het eerst met die tekst en dan zie je, dan kan je elke fragment herleiden tot een toren. 
waar je moet binnengaan, die je moet overmeesteren, die je moet overwinnen. En die toren moet je zelf rangschikken. De reden waarom die twee beelden hier staan, is dat het ene gewoon het naakte beeld is van zo zitten de fragmenten in elkaar. En hij heeft het in zijn thesis ook over een aantal punten waar ik het totaal mee eens ben. En dat is de gelijktijdigheid. Alles is altijd gelijktijdig aanwezig. En het begin en het midden en het einde zijn altijd aanwezig. Dus je moet keuze maken. Je moet binnen, binnen jouw eigen dramaturgie gaan ontdekken. Niet wat is A, wat is B, wat is C. Maar hoe liggen de verhoudingen tussen die dingen. En vandaar het tweede beeld omdat hij daar, ik ga even uit het beeld, want ze hadden mij dat daar straks gebruikt, maar ik was het vergeten. Het tweede beeld, daar trekt hij dus krachtlijnen. Van het ene moment naar het andere moment. Gewoon om duidelijk te maken dat alles met elkaar verbonden is, maar anders kan bekeken worden. Dus elk woord heeft een, een, een ander woord als tegengestelde, of wat het is heel complex, dus ik ga het niet helemaal uitleggen. Trouwens, dan heb ik uh, meer dan uh, dat nodig om het te kunnen zien. Het is maar het idee. Het idee is dat, de, dat het zo'n groot bereik is, zo enorm is, en dat dat het werk is wat dan niet gebeurt op repetitie. Dat is het werk wat gebeurt thuis. Dat gebeurt terwijl je groenten staat te snijden, een soepje maakt, de bedden opmaakt of uh, iets anders doet. Ja, er zijn wel dingen die je dan doet thuis waar je echt met tekst formaal niet bezig bent. Maar uh, het, het is iets wat, wat je in je lijf moet krijgen. En dat is erg belangrijk. Dat het ontsnapt aan... De, 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 uh, hoe zal ik zeggen? Aan, aan een, een analytisch realisme. Of een literaire analyse die zo strikt is dat je nog altijd Molière speelt, zoals in de tijd van Molière. Dat je nog altijd je stem omhoog brengt als je Racine speelt. De brutaliteit die een Shakespeare had en die je niet altijd ziet als de Britten zelf Shakespeare verfilmen, dan zeggen ze ook, oh, nou, is het is een ding van my discontent made some about the son of York. En dan denk ik, pardon, waar heeft u het over? He, het, 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 het down to earth, twee voet op de aarde, dat is het moeilijkste. In dat idee heeft hij het ook over twee belangrijke dingen. En dat is de gelijktijdigheid, zoals ik net al zei. Alles is altijd gelijktijdig aanwezig. En over de, het instinct en de impulsen. En dat kan niemand je leren, dat moet je zelf ontwikkelen. Je hebt soms het gevoel, ik moet naar hier. Kan de regisseur zeggen, nee, dat is niet goed. Dan zeg ik altijd, ik voel aan mijn water dat dat heel goed is. Dus ik ben daar vrij uh, sterk. Ik heb de kracht van mijn overtuigingen, helaas. En t, t, uh, hij heeft het natuurlijk in zijn analyse niet echt over de inhoud. Want het inhoud is gewoon een verhaal, een kort verhaal van Proust. Hij heeft zijn werk rond... Uh, gegevens van Proust gemaakt, maar het heeft iets te maken met gewoon hoe de dingen in elkaar kunnen schuiven. Het is een soort van accordeon. Je doet het dicht, je trekt het open en naar gelang hoe, welke noot je moet hebben, hoe de lucht in het, in, in het uh, instrument komt, krijg je net een iets ander beeld, net zoals een periacter. Zo'n ding waar je Kinderen vinden dat erg leuk, waar je door kijkt, je schudt ermee. En het zijn dezelfde steentjes die erin zitten, maar het beeld is compleet anders. Dus, woorden. We hebben het over woorden. Zit ik nog op tijd? Zit ik nog op schema? Mag ik nog even door? Ja? Nee, nee, maar ik heb een soort van tijdslimiet. En als ik begin, dan heb ik, hou ik de tijd niet. Ik weet ook niet wanneer zijn je, jullie zijn vroeger binnengekomen en hebben hier nog tien minuten, tien minuten gezeten. Ik dacht ook wanneer. When does to, do we start? Huh? Maar ja. Dus, um, de, 
hij zegt ook dat je als, als acteur eigenlijk, uh, hoe zal ik het zeggen, ben je alleen verantwoordelijk voor je zegging. En de zegging, hoe je het presenteert, dat is het gevolg van al dat gezoek en gevroed en dat, uh, die ontdekkingstocht, die zoektocht naar wat is nu het moment en de manier waarop iets helder wordt, waarop iets verder gaat dan de woordjes op het papier, waarop het woord een wereld wordt. Een wereld die door de kijker en de luisteraar kan aangenomen worden. Dat is het werk. And it's not an easy job, I can tell you. I've been at it for very long. Dus, ja, ik heb hier zo'n paar papiertjes. Maar wat wou ik nu ook alweer zeggen, dat ik het niet weet. Dat duurt dan even. Ja, woorden. We hadden het over woorden. Dus, ik neem mijn trouwe vriend er even bij. Ja, mijn ogen zijn niet meer wat ze geweest zijn. Dus, woorden die wringen tegen. He? Ze, ze, wat staat hier? Ja, ze spannen zich. He? Ze schuiven, ze slippen, ze blijven nooit stilstaan. Ze kraken en soms breken ze onder de last en onder de druk. En ze vervallen door onnauwkeurigheid, belangrijk hier, onnauwkeurigheid. En blijven nooit op hun plaats, staan nooit stil. Dus ja, het heeft er natuurlijk ook mee te maken... Dat mens eigenlijk <coughs> alleen maar woorden heeft om datgene te zeggen wat hij niet meer voelt. Of een manier waarop hij niet meer geneigd is het te zeggen. En dat zijn stukjes van de vier kwartetten van Thomas Eliot. De folk words. Daar zijn er nog, dat is mijn... Bijbel zal ik maar zeggen. Dat klinkt heel zwaar op de hand, maar ja. En, uh, wacht, ik zoek even het tweede stukje. Waar is het dan? Nog een stukje. Ja. <coughs> Daar gaan we dan. Um. Ja, je stijgt dan. <laughs> ja, verlakkelijk dus, hè. hè? En, en, ja, en, en ik, 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 probeer, ik probeer woorden te gebruiken. En, uh, en elke poging is een, is een nieuw soort falen. Het is een, uh, het, <laughs> een verschillende soort mislukking, eigenlijk. Ja, omdat, zoals ik al zei, een mens alleen maar geneigd is om woorden te gebruiken voor... Datgene wat hij niet meer voelt. Zolang je het voelt, oh, is er alleen het gevoel. En kan je het niet onder woorden brengen. Of, of ook niet een manier waarop het... Uh, ah. Ja, wat is nog eens... Uh, ja, elke poging eigenlijk, hè, staat hier, is een nieuw begin. En een uh, nieuw begin in het onverwoorden. Dat klinkt beter in het Engels, hoor. Dat zal je straks... Dus ik bedoel, een klein stukje in het Engels. En het is een ordeloze boel van gevoelens en tuchteloze bende van emoties. Hè? En... Uh, dit is... Een, een, uh, wat, ja. Ja, en wat, wat wij proberen... Wat wij proberen aan ons te binden en te onderwerpen... Door kracht en overtuiging is al eenmaal of tweemaal of vele malen onderworpen door mensen die het al gedaan hebben en die wij nooit zullen evenaren. Maar er is geen winst of verlies. Er is enkel de poging. Ja, voor, ons, voor ons is die poging... Het belangrijkste, het enige. En de rest is niet onze zaak. Voor als, ik hoor jullie later ook nog, there is only the trying. The rest is not 
our business. Ja, je zal zeggen, hè. Ik heb het al gezegd. Ja, je herhaalt wat u al gezegd hebt. Maar ja, ik wil het nog eens zeggen. Mag ik het nog eens zeggen? Ja. Ja, het is, als je, het, het is een, een weg die je moet gaan. Je moet je dat voorstellen, dat werk, als een pad waar je langs loopt. Het, het, het is een weg en je weet dat je bepaalde deuren opent of bepaalde deuren niet. Een poort waar je aan voorbij gaat. Het is telkens keuzes maken. En soms gebruik je een weg en dan sta je halverwege op die weg. Dan denk je, nee, dat was het niet. Oké, okay, terug. Een andere weg. Zo gaat het. Het is een kwestie van onderzoeken en het is een kwestie van ontdekken. Wij zijn eigenlijk, iedereen, wij zijn allemaal ontdekkingsreizigers. En oude mensen zouden ontdekkingsreizigers moeten zijn. Dat schrijft Elliot en dat is ook waar. Omdat een lang leven veel geleerd heeft. Niet altijd wijsheid. Niet iedereen heeft de wijsheid in spee, maar een, een soort van begrip voor een verscheidenheid die momenteel toch een beetje beknot wordt, waarvan ik voel dat er één grote, dat we allemaal zo hi ho, hi ho, ha ha ha, als uh, uh, de, de kaboutertjes naar de, wei, de mijnen achter elkaar moeten lopen en dat het wilde, het exuberante, de rock and roll dreigt verloren te gaan. Nee? Goed. Heel goed. En ja, je, je moet dus, je moet dus uh, die ontdekkingstocht is ook ermee rekening houden dat je dingen verliest. Dat is, je houdt niet alles bij in het leven. En sommige dingen zijn, ontsnappen je, vallen als zand door je handen. En dat vind je ook terug in sommige teksten. En daar moet je mee leven. Daar moet je mee, mee omgaan. En ik denk dat dat het... Uh, ha, misschien is het begin. De eerste stap op de weg naar de eenzaamheid. Is het verlies van mensen die je kader, je referentiekader niet hebben meegemaakt. Mensen die niet meer weten, stom voorbeeld, dat er vroeger voor de opera in Antwerpen het monument van Peter Benoit stond, wat nu ergens verborgen is in het Harmoniepark waar nooit een hond komt. Mensen die, die, uh, in, die nog weten wat het was toen. Die nog weten waar ze waren toen ze hoorden dat Kennedy vermoord werd. Die nog hebben meegemaakt, uh, de, of via hun ouders hebben meegekregen, dat uh, het eerste wezen in de ruimte een hondje was. Laika, hè? in de Sputnik. En dat ze hun, hun uh, de remedie ook uh, Sputnik hebben genoemd. Ik zat in dat ding en ik zei, geef mij maar een Sputnik hoor. Maar ja, hij was, niet, uh, hij was er niet. Ik heb het over het spuitje, hè. <lacht> Juist. Zo. So. Dat is, zijn de vragen tot hiertoe. Ik ben hier nu toch. Dus uh, kunt u net zo goed uh, iets zeggen. Um, het is een... It's a special journey. Ik ga even terug naar het Engels. Ja? Is het goed? Ja? Het is... Uh, it, It is, has been a very special occasion to be here. And all this, what I like also about this, is that to me, all these elements, like that one, oh, I'll first talk about this one. It is, uh, I don't really know what it is. It looks like a glass bell. There is also something in it which I don't quite know what it is, but uh, he will know. I haven't asked him yet. I thought, well, I'll just treat the things very gently. And for me, in a way, 
this could be a representation of time. Because I know that time is a straight line. That is so boring. <laughs> because it's not, it is true, but for a human, it is, it isolates you from whatever there has been, from wherever you have performed, from the people you have met and the audience that were booing or enthusiastic or whatever. To me, the way I feel it within my bones is that I am within a crystal ball, a sphere, not unlike that one, maybe, and that that ball rolls down on its metal rails of time. So I go forward, but I do not forget all these things that surround me and that have made me who I am or have impressed me or depressed me, brought me joy or brought me grief. They are fragments when they come. Sometimes it's just the lyrics of a song. Sometimes it's a work of art that you see somewhere in a museum. And sometimes it is someone who passes and who makes you think of another person or who has such a lust for life that you wish you were 50 years younger. And that is a nice thing that is not a tragedy. It is a fact of life. So we have Ganesha. We have, well, I was going to say this penis-like thing. Well, I mean, that would take it too far, wouldn't it? Uh, it is, yeah. It, it looks like something that could have come out of a, out of an Egyptian tomb. It is, to me, something that incorporates beauty and incorporates the past, something that was buried, something that was not shown, not seen for a long time and at one point was unearthed and brought to light. And I know I have to be very careful with it because it's wobbly. And I promised him Allah, that I would be very careful with it. So that is, uh, so we have that and that and that. And it's not, of course, I can't put, there are, I have been in performances where there were momento mori on stage, where there were small pillars a lot. You know it, and something, some had a coffee machine. I mean, it was really, mm hmm. Uh, but it, it brought a world together. And if there is nothing, it is only the movement of the actor, the thinking of the actor, and the way he uses the space, which I love, that gives meaning. Because elements of the space, as in what you saw in the beginning, eh, the seven pillars of King Solomon. So every angle that you have in this, in this space, not only where you are, but there, it's where you throw it and then you go in the opposite direction and you know, this is where it should be. Here is truth. Here is veracity. Here I can do anything and it changes with every thought with every aspect with every item of your personality that you use and that you misuse and and that you share you share your humanity and that is important not just oh la did she did that very well did she <laughs> yeah oops sorry yeah sure she did no it is something deeper it is something existential. It is some, you touch sometimes somebody in places they did not even know they had. Force them to think about something they did not even know they would, one, 
day be confronted with on a stage and that my dear friends is when the word has indeed become a world and that image to me that painting i think it's painting isn't it no it's paperwork. it's paperwork see i told you i have bad eyes <laughs> but that the fact that it's paperwork or not is not important what is important me standing here uh, at their invitation is that when i saw it i immediately said this stays because to me this in a way reflects what i've been talking about i've been talking about small things that erupt within your soul your body your mind without that without your even knowing how to catalog them because you have no no library in your head for these forgotten and yet remembered moments and it's like all of these elements to me grow into something that we do not know what is but it is my crystal ball of time and all these elements and all these things are experiences to be known but not always to be talked about all these private things also to be taken and absorbed by this bigger image by something that grows and grows and does not stop growing because we are explorers we are all uh, exploring things and at the end of all our exploration we will arrive where we started from and then we will know the place finally as it is sometimes you have to make a big detour to arrive at this sense of simplicity a sense of simplicity and i will where did i put it oh here oh my god old woman bear with me i have to look it up yes T.S. Eliot, it's one of the last passages, and after that I will read the beginning passage. <laughs> Because with all I've been telling you, I think it will resound differently in your bodies and in your minds. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Quick, now, here, now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, which costs no less than everything and all shall be well and all matters of things shall be well and then we did not talk about the flames but then he says when the tongues of flames are enfolded eh que pasa are enfolded into the crowned knot of flame and the fire and the rose are one and now i will give you the beginning time present and time's past are both perhaps present in time future and time future contained in time past 
if all time is eternally present, all time is irredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction. Only in the world of speculation, what might have been and what has been point to one end that is always present. And footfalls echo huh, down the hallway to the bus we did not take, to the door we never opened in the rose garden. And my words echo thus in your minds. But to what purpose disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves? I do not know. Other footfalls echo in the garden. Shall we follow him? Quick, said the bird. Quick, quick, find them. Yes, the bird. Go, 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 said the bird. Humankind cannot take very much realism. Reality. Time past and time present. Hmm. What has been and what might have been point to one end that is always present. Yes? <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, I won't touch you anymore. He's wobbling already. That was it. I can go a bit further if you like. Thank you. Oh, well. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Oh, go and go have chips and go and have a glass of wine or something. <laughs>